the book of John, chapter number eight this morning. And uh, let's put my microphone on here. John chapter. Our first habit is the habit of reading our Bible, which but we uh, sometimes need to be reminded because uh, our first habit is the Bible. We gotta get microphone on. There we go. All right. John 8. So this is kind of our jump off verse, John 8, 31, 32, uh, just where we kind of uh, start from. And then we'll, we'll be in a couple other passages this morning. Glad that you're here. Uh, let's just get into it. John 8, 31. The Bible says, <clears throat> Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Let's pray. Let's ask for the Lord's help and blessing on the day. Lord, uh, we are thankful to be in your house. And uh, this morning, we just would pray that you would help us to, to take to heart the, the word of God. The things that are here that are for our help and benefit, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, show us how to incorporate these things into our daily life so that they'll make a difference um, in how we grow and how we uh, walk. Uh, Lord, we just we need your help today. That's why we're gathered. We thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those who are here. I, I pray that you would bless throughout the day. Um, we pray you'd magnify yourself here and just, just lift up your word amongst us. Uh, that's what we really need. I pray for your help as I teach this lesson and then preach in the hour to follow. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so notice right there in the, the verse that we're starting with that Jesus is talking to some Jews who believed on him. So uh, conceivably, we could say these are uh, uh, Christians. I know they're not called Christians quite yet when we're in John 8, but they're believers in Christ. And so as a believer in the Lord, we would often say, well, we're disciples of the Lord. We're followers of the Lord. But it's interesting what the Lord says to these believers. He says, all right, believers, now, if you want to be disciples, here's what you do. You continue in my word. So apparently we can be a believer without being a disciple. And it is very true. A disciple is a committed follower of the Lord Jesus, a committed follower. Now, not everyone who's saved is a committed follower of Christ. Um, there are people who have gotten saved and, and, and they made the decision to trust Christ, but then um, they, they just sort of didn't move on from there. They didn't keep going or they fell back into their old ways, something like that, and, and they haven't. Uh, follow Christ. There are some who have followed Christ so far, and then when it began to cost them more than perhaps they wanted to, they would stop. And so the Lord's just saying this, if you, if you want to be my disciples, believer, you must continue in my word. Continue in my word. So that is the habit this week, is that we would <clears throat> have the habit of continuing in the word of God. And again, uh, habits are, are important. They're, they're, our, our life is essentially made up of habits and decisions and things that we do. And so we want to have some holy habits. And th the first habit needs to be that we would stay with God's word. So I'm just going to run you through the stuff. Uh, by the way, if you don't have any notes this morning, I think we printed off a few extras. Does everybody have notes? We got some. Hey, Jax. I don't know where he's at. Uh, Brother Luke, Jax knows where those notes are. Oh, maybe they're right there. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. He stepped out for a sec. I think he counts. He's counting. Oh, there he is. All right. We found him. We found him. Yeah, that way you have some notes. And so from last week, I'll run you through uh, the first few blanks and just briefly touch on uh, what we talked about until we get down to where we uh, ended. We kind of dealt with the Bible itself last week and the importance of it and, and what it is. And this week, we'll look at practically how to, to make a habit out of of the Bible and out of, of, of your Bible reading. So the first thing we did is just to try to define the word that Jesus uses here in John 8, which is the word continue. And that word means to remain, to abide, to sojourn, to tarry, to be held, uh, to be kept continually. And so it just means to be um, 
to be regularly visiting God's Word. And uh, my grandmother, <clears throat> on uh, actually both my grandmothers have the habit of reading uh, their Bible, but one, my, my grandmother on my mom's side who's passed away, I always think of her when I think of um, Bible reading and, and really this idea of continuing in the Word because um, my, my grandmother, I think she read the Bible through something like 40 times. Uh, she started reading it once a year, uh, probably before I was born, I don't remember. And, and she, um, she would read it every, every year. She'd read the Bible through. And she would tell me, and she told me often that, because when you went to Grandma's house, if it was a certain time in the morning, you were going to find her at the kitchen table with her Bible reading. That's where you're going to find her. And um, there were two things my grandma did. She read her Bible and she played solitaire uh, with, co- with actual cards, not with the phone. And uh, it, her, her cards, uh, her, her playing cards were worn on the top right corner. So all the cards were worn from her dealing those out and playing solitaire. And if you turn the deck over, they were worn on that side too. Uh, what else was worn were the top corner pages of her Bible. And uh, th- those are the things that she was, that I, I remember her for um, the most. And then also something that she told me uh, when we were fishing together that I'll tell you in the morning service. Um, but anyway, she was one who had a habit. She continually abided in God's Word. She, every time I would go over there, if it was, like I said, 9 or 10 in the morning, she would be there. You could just find her there at the kitchen table reading her Bible. And she told me this, um, because I think as a, as a young kid, I asked the question something like, haven't you read that before? Or some kind of question like that. Because, you know, as a kid, you're seeing her, she's always reading it. It's like, hey, haven't you read that by now? Or aren't you done with that yet? I thought I saw you doing that last year, you know, that kind of thing. And, and she told me, she said, every day that I read it, I learn something new. Every time I come back through a book that I've read before, I learn something new. And so the Bible is not a book that, you know, we can take and read once or we can take and selectively read various passages and, and then call it a day. No, it's a Bible we have to continue in because it is a, a, the Word of God. It's alive um, and, it, and it has truth for us each and every day. So we need to continue. Um, the second thing we said is that to be effective, the Bible must be applied. It seems obvious, um, but, but I gave that George Foreman illustration where he carried a Bible for good luck. He just thought if he had a Bible in his bag, in his gym bag, that he'd be a better boxer. Um, and, and a lot of people think that just because they're toting around the Bible uh, or they have one at home, that somehow God is going to uh, just, they're just going to sort of kind of have a good luck charm. And that's not how it works. It must be open, read, and obeyed. It's not even just good enough to read it. We've got to follow and, and listen to God's word as well. So, gave you a few facts about the Bible uh, being a supernatural book. So, if you didn't get the notes, just jot it down. The Bible was written by more than 40 authors. Those authors were writing over a span of about 1,500 years. Three different continents in three different languages. Yet, the whole book agrees cover to cover without any mistakes or contradictions. So just some things about the Bible. Uh, we said the Bible is made up of pure words. The Bible is given to us through a process of divine inspiration, meaning that God inspired His Word. And uh, Remember, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like inspiration like maybe an artist would get if they saw something beautiful and they thought, oh, I'm inspired, and then they go and they do a painting. It, was, it wasn't that sort of inspiration. Um, it was, it was God breathed. So inspiration means God breathed. It means that God spoke the words as first Peter tells us through his prophets. And so quite literally gave us his words. Again, it, this is important. Um, he gave us his word. So we believe in verbal plenary inspiration. And that just simply means verbal. We have God's words. Some people believe we just have God's thoughts, His ideals, His concepts, okay? We do have those through having His words. The words of the Bible are important. That's what God gave us, His Word. 
Okay, so verbal meaning words, plenary meaning we have all of them, um, all of them that God intended for us to have, and all those things were inspired. Okay, then God preserved his word through a process of divine preservation. We looked at a couple verses on that, but the Lord gave man his word and then has continued to do the miracle of preserving the word. So the Bible I hold today is not close to the word of God or contains some of the thoughts of God or whatever. No, this is the word of God in written form. Every word. <clears throat> then we said the words are precious. And kind of here's where, you know, we do a little preaching. Because um, we have so many Bibles that sometimes the word, um, well, we can just forget how, how precious the word of God is. And so that's kind of where we got through last week. I gave you some funny but not so funny stats on uh, people, what they believe about things in the Bible. Uh, and they're funny because they're so ridiculous, but they're not funny because you can't believe that people would actually not know some of the very obvious things uh, about, uh, about the Bible. So um, this morning, then, we're going to get into the next part, which is really how we are going to help ourselves in our life and how we're going to develop the habit. And the, it starts with having an appetite for the Word. Okay, so turn to 1 Peter 2, and we'll look at 1 Peter 2. <clears throat> having an appetite for the Word. 1 Peter 2, verse number 2. We're actually going to look at a lot of scriptures. I think I have most of them up here, um, but we'll turn to them. If I don't, we'll, we'll kind of, I'll click through and we'll see. But notice what 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. So now here is actually a commandment by Peter. We don't really think of this statement as a commandment, but he's, he's telling us to desire the Word of God. He's saying, you, you folks, you Christians, need to have a desire for God's Word. And he says, as newborn babes. Now, uh, we got some babies in here recently, uh, and all of you have been a baby before, so you know babies desire, what, what do they desire? Milk. And they let you know when it is time, do they not? They let you know when they need some more. And, and uh, I don't know if they ever think they get enough, but uh, as, a, as a baby desires milk, a Christian should desire the Word. Why? Well, Peter says that ye may grow thereby. A baby won't grow if it's not uh, getting proper nutrition. And, and so uh, a Christian will not grow if we're not getting proper nutrition nutrition from the word. So we need to have a desire, a hunger, an appetite for God's word. And I, I'll, I'm just here to tell you, that's the reason we struggle with our Bible reading is we don't have a desire for it. I mean, just be, I, I hate to be so mean on a Sunday morning, but that is the reason. I, I don't ever forget to eat. Y'all probably can tell by looking at me. I don't ever forget. I don't ever just go a day and be like, you know what? I haven't eaten today. Now, maybe I miss lunch every now and then because you get busy or something. But um, no, I, you know, I, there's something that happens in my body that's like, hey, dude, go eat. Go eat something. Um, in fact, after you eat like half an hour later, it's telling you that again. Go eat something. That's the, that's the appetite. But spiritually, we should have the same sort of draw, the same sort of appetite for the Word of God. And the reason we struggle with our Bible reading is because we don't have the appetite. And that's a problem. That's a major problem. So we have to develop an appetite for God's Word. Now, just get, let me give you a few things. The Bible itself likens itself many times to food. So we'll go through a, a few uh, uh, verses here. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, The words were found... Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord of hosts. 
Look at Revelation 10. I've got it here. If you want to look in your Bible, you can as well. Revelation 10, verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now, it's really interesting. Uh, I'm going to read another passage in Ezekiel. It's very similar. Um, but both of these prophets, when they're told to eat the word of God, it's sweet when they eat it, but then it makes their stomach hurt. And it's because the, the word that they're eating is God's word. It's sweet, but then they're going to have to give judgment. They're going to have to prophesy judgment because of what they've understood. Ezekiel 2, verse 8 says, Be thou son of man, I'm sorry, but thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, and mourning, and woe. Then we go to, oh, let's go back. I got another verse here, Ezekiel 3, 1 through 3. Uh, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak in the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. How would you like to be one of these Old Testament prophets? I mean, so I opened my mouth, he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Now, by all appearances, um, the, these prophets literally ate what was given to them, it seems. Um, but I, I want you to understand it's not what God's telling us to do today. Um, the Ethiopian emperor, uh, his name is Menelik II, he took this quite literally. Uh, he got sick. He was eating pages of the Bible in his belief that it would cure him. And he died in 1913 after ingesting the entire book of 2 Kings. Uh, that's found in a, in a book called Your God is Too Safe by Mark Buchanan. Um, so don't take the advice of that emperor and try to eat God's word. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure none of you are, are going to try that. But I believe that what God's trying to tell us is God's word is something we need to take in. It's something that we need to ingest, not by chewing it up and swallowing it, but by reading it and uh, meditating on it and thinking over it and mulling over it and allowing that word of God to nourish us. Uh, I'm going to show you several other verses here. Job chapter 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now, uh, who, who in here would be, I mean, don't raise your hand, but who in here would be able to say, man, I get hungry for God's word more often than I get hungry for lunch. I don't know that any of us would raise our hand. Yours truly included. But that's what Job said. I have esteemed the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. Um, Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when, for... The time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and it becomes such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Again, a comparison in the Bible, likening the scripture to food. He's, and Paul's kind of getting on to these Hebrews. He's saying, you should be teachers by now, but we're going to have to go back and teach you the first things, the first principles. You, in, instead of eating meat, you're eating or you need to drink milk, okay? So again, just likening it to food. Let me see if I got this one here. Yeah, 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Of course, your Bible is actually open to that one. And then one more. Jesus said this, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There was a time when Jesus was uh, uh, dealing with his disciples and they, uh, they start talking about dinner and Jesus says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And the disciples start arguing, where did he get meat? Where did Jesus get something to eat? We've been with him the whole time. He wasn't talking about food, was he? So, so 
again, the Bible likens itself so many times to, uh, to food. The fact that we need to take it in. We need to chew on it. We need to, uh, uh, and again, not only is it something that we need to in, sort of ingest and um, digest and um, chew on and meditate, but the, the thing about the food is we don't go very far between meals, do we? Some of you ate breakfast before you came. You're already thinking about lunch. All of my kids, while eating one meal, will ask us about the next meal. They're eating lunch. They'll be like, hey, what are we having for dinner? I'm not hungry now, but I'm going to be. I'm just going to prepare. Like, we don't go that far between meals. Why? Because, well, we get hungry. We have an appetite. We, we, we want to fill our bellies. It's, it's part of, you know, it, it keeps us alive. Well, spiritually... How long has it been since you had a good meal? You know, sometimes you, you go a long stretch between meals spiritually. And let me just tell you, Sunday to Sunday, it's not enough. What if you ate once a week? I mean, just think about it. What if you only ate on Sundays? Well, you wouldn't look like me. <laughs> no. But spiritually, that's a lot, of, a lot of Christians. They nibble a little bit on Sunday morning. And that's all they get. It's not good enough. That's why the Bible likens itself so many times to food and, and eating and taking it in. Now, turn to Psalm 19 with me. Psalm 19, I think. Yeah, I don't have it up here. So turn over there. Psalm 19. Again, same idea that the, the Bible likens it to itself to food. By the way, Brother Wayne, this is a singable song right here. Yeah, yeah, so you know it. Okay, there's one that we can incorporate. I'm just saying we're kind of doing that on Sunday school time. So, but Psalm 19, if you'll look down to verse number 7. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So he's talking about God's word, the law, the statutes, the, the fear of the Lord, the commandments, the testimony of the Lord. He's talking about the word of God. Then verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, our problem in Christianity, our problem in our lives is not the Bible. Our problem is not, um, a lot of people are like, well, it's just so hard to understand. It's real hard to understand when you don't read it. It is. I mean, I, I hate, to, sometimes it's just better to just say it. It's really hard to understand what you won't read. Um, you know, we, we deal with it. We homeschool our kids. And so I'm not picking on any of our kids today because all homeschooled kids deal with this. But mom tells the kid, hey, go read chapter nine. That's, that's you know, part of your lesson. today. So they, they go away for a little while. My wife's smiling. She knows. They go away for a little while, long enough, presumably, to have read chapter 9. All right, now you got a, now you got a quiz. So come over here and going to load up the computer here. We're going to take your quiz. Kid gets a, like 42 on his quiz or her quiz. And it's like, did you, well, how do you not know this? Because I'm, you know, as, as a parent that I'm looking in the book, every one of the quiz questions is bolded in the book. It's bolded. It's like you didn't have to read all of it. You just read the bold stuff. And you'd know this question. How do you not know this? Did you read this? I read it. You can tell they didn't read it. Listen, you can't understand something you don't read. I'm tired of hearing all oh, the Bible so hard to understand. Yes, there are parts that are difficult to understand, no doubt. Study to show thyself approved. We got to do that. We understand. There's going to be places and things that we got to study. We got to chew on. Every time we read a passage, we'll learn new things. It's a great thing. 
but we'll never understand what we don't read. And our problem is not really understanding, it's the lack of the appetite. I know something about food, I typically always want it. If you have food, I'm in. I want it. And after I eat it, it doesn't take me long to get hungry again. But spiritually, I can just fast for days. And that's not good. As newborn babes, I'm just telling you, if you if you're in that newborn stage or you've been there before, it seems like every 30 minutes that baby is wanting something. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. I read a story of a college professor um, who was given a kind note. I guess it was a Bible college. And the student thanked him for his daily devotions that he would give. The, the pe- professor would give a da- daily devotion. The student thanked him for the daily devotions and, and said, those devotions kept my faith alive. Now, most of us, would, as a professor, would have been flattered and like, oh, my devotions, you know. But this professor was upset. Why in the world would someone rely on my devotions to keep their faith alive? It's not how it's supposed to be. Now, I'll never give up the conviction that we ought to come to church. And I'll never give up the conviction that we ought to have more church. The Bible tells us, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So uh, we, if anything, we should uh, decide to have more services, not less services. And that's always how I'm going to be. I, I love church and I, and I believe Jesus instituted the church. I believe he died and paid for the church. And I believe church is an incredibly important part of our life. I believe we can receive God's word in the church and be discipled in the church and grow in the church. But listen, listening to messages Sunday to Sunday is not enough to sustain your spiritual life. Because guess what? I'm not going to be there preaching at you on Tuesday afternoon when your boss is acting worldly or the people around you are acting worldly or you're having to make some big decision for your family. You have to have been in God's word that day and have God's word in your heart that day, it's interesting, God, um, he, he gives you, when you're faithful to his word each day, it's so funny how then later that day you encounter something, and that verse that you read that morning comes up, and it's like, oh, the Lord already told me how to deal with this. My wife does that to me all the time. I'll be telling her about something, she's like, oh, let me show you what I read this morning, and she'll start preaching to me, you know, <laughs> which is, I'm thankful for, by the way. But she'll be like, oh, no, no, it's, it's, no, it's super encouraging because we'll be going through something together. And she's like, well, listen to this verse I read this morning and, 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 and we'll read it together and it will help. We. The church is here. It, it's got a great purpose. Um, again, never will back down from our need to be at church, but we need to be nourishing ourselves daily in his word. Okay, so turn to Exodus 16 with me, and we'll get to the end of this lesson, which is making the Bible a regular part of your day. Exodus 16. So um, right at the top of my Bible where it gives you like the, a little blurb of what's happening on the page, it says the Israelites murmur for want of bread. Okay, there's no lack of appetite. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're, they're hungry and, and they're, um, the Lord's going to give them something here. So look at Exodus 16, look at verse 14. Actually, go back to verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that the even the quails came up and covered the camp. In the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that was um, and when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, 
it is manna, for they wist not what it was. Um, manna, the word means, what is it? Okay, so they, they grab it, like, what is it? Manna, that's manna. They didn't know what it was. What is it? And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. And Omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take you every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, of course, but some of them left it. I added the of course, by the way. But some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Now, wouldn't that be a weird way to get your groceries? You wake up every morning, apparently before the sun comes up, uh, or before the sun's hot, and you go outside, and you find these small round things that another passage tells us has the flavor of like a coriander seed. And you go out there, and you don't even know what it is, so you just call it manna, because the manna means what is it. And they go and they gather the manna, and, and they have to gather enough for the day. And everyone has to gather different amounts according to their eating. But they don't, they're not able to keep it till the next day because God's going to provide fresh manna the next morning. And part of that was they had to have faith in the Lord. Right? You, you would just, if you're like me, you'd be like, let's just go out there and get the wheelbarrow. And let's just fill up as much manna as we can get because what about tomorrow? I mean, what if, what if we get hungry tomorrow? And there were some people that did that. You, you see, Moses said, don't, you know, don't leave it till the next day. God's going to provide this thing daily. So trust the Lord. He's going to provide it daily and go out there and just get one day's worth. And so they went out there and they got one day's worth. Each man got what he could eat that day. Each woman, same thing. And what's interesting is they had to get it before the sun. If you didn't get out there in time, it melted. That's some weird food. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get to know what that's all about, but that's some strange food. The sun just melts it. There's some practical stuff we can learn here because, again, that's like I said, the Bible li likens itself to food and God providing our needs. So um, here's how we make the Bible a regular part of our day. We gather it daily. Daily. You, you need spiritual nourishment every day. You say, well, I read 24 chapters yesterday, so I'm good for the week. Here's something. Here's something I know about my brain. It can only retain about this much information at any given time. And if I read, again, nothing wrong with reading 24 chapters a day. Um, if, if, that's your, if, you, if that's your plan, that's what you're doing, that's great. But don't do it that one day and then expect to remember all that stuff and it to get you through the whole week. God wants to speak to you every day. Every day, His mercies are new. Every morning, He wants to, to give you what you need spiritually for the day. Every day. So again, I mean, we get all excited about our Bible reading. We read a bunch of chapters and, and we're like, man, I really did it today. And then the next day, you're like, well, you know, I read enough yesterday covered that or i'll you know what this weekend i'll just read a bunch all at once you're missing the point okay the point of reading your bible is not to <laughs> i almost said read your bible um the point of reading your bible is not just to get to the end right like when you read a book a novel maybe the point is to get through the story get to the end finish the book and then get another book and read that, and it's more for entertainment. The point of reading your Bible is daily spiritual nourishment. The point of reading your Bible is, God, I need something from you today that apparently I didn't need yesterday, and I won't need tomorrow. But I need something today from you, and so I'm going to read the Word. So make a daily practice. You say, well, when should I do it? Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. So pause on the when should we do it. But here's the thing, do it. 
every day. In the Bible, every day. Uh, the second point that I get out of this text in Exodus 16 is this. Gather as much as you need. Gather as much as you need. Um, it, for me, this has kind of been seasonal, <laughs> if you will. There were times when um, I've, I've done a plan where I read the whole Bible in three months. And you're reading about 16 to 20 chapters a day, and you're just really taking in a lot of the Bible every single day. Um, there are other times where I was reading just a couple of chapters a day um, because that, that's what the Lord sort of impressed upon my heart to do, whatever the case is. So um, it's not like we have to set up. We like the one-year Bible plan, I think, just because it, it really works. Like we, we understand it. You know, we got a 12-month calendar, 365 days. We can spread out the chapters and, and have a pretty reasonable amount of stuff to read every day if we do that. There's nothing wrong with that. If you say, man, a one-year plan really works for me, and that's, that really helps me, it, it gives me enough of the scriptures each day, then do that. If you say, man, reading the whole Bible in a full year is too much, four chapters for me is too much, then read the whole Bible over two years. Um, it's not about how much you read. It really isn't. It's just that you are reading. Now, don't read Jesus wept every other day and call it good. Okay? You, you understand what I'm saying? You, you need God's Word every day. I don't know how much you need. I mean, as a pastor, I try to encourage everyone to read through their Bible in the year. Um, but in the past, I've had people have said, you know, if I read four chapters, the, the, I miss the last two because I don't know. You know, they, it's just too much information in one setting. Or it takes them too long. Maybe they're a little bit slower reader or, or whatever the case is. And, and my, my answer to that has always been, just read your Bible. If you read one chapter a day, you're doing better than reading zero chapters a day. If you read one chapter a day and you really understood it and you thought about it and you applied it to your life, you're, reading, you're doing better than a guy that's reading 16 chapters a day but not applying it and not thinking about it and just checking it off the list. These folks were to gather food to eat, to get them the nourishment that they needed. And so what I'm saying is it's not a one-size-fits-all. There's a whole lot of different things. You know, you're going through a season of, of trial. Maybe you need to read through the book of Psalms. You're, you're lacking wisdom to make big life decisions. Maybe you need to read through the book of Proverbs. Um, again, as much as you need. Then... I love this. Uh, I love this this point here in Exodus sixteen. You got to gather it before the sun melts it. The lazy person in Exodus sixteen didn't get anything to eat because they. By the time they got out there, the sun melted. Melt, sun melted the, the sun didn't melt. The sun melted the. What is it, manna? Exactly. <laughs> um. I'm not, I'm not saying you should get up at 4 a.m. and read your Bible at 4 a.m. I don't get up at 4 a.m. Ask Wayne about that. He's good at getting up at 4 a.m. or earlier. Um, if you are an early riser, it's a great thing to do. This idea about before the sun melts it is this, and I, I've experienced this. I experienced this this week, and I told my wife I knew I should have read my Bible. I, I got up, and immediately things were like, hey, take care of this, take care of this, take care of this. One of those days. And so I was like, well, I'll read, I'll read later on this evening, you know. And then, you know what happened? All of a sudden, the day was stressful, and I told my wife, I said, should have read my Bible. Should have read it this morning. This, this week, this happened. Now, I will tell you, I did end up reading it. But I should have read it before the sun melted it. What I'm saying is before your day gets going, you need to be with God, whatever that means. Before your day really takes off and you get busy, because here's the thing. First of all, um, it's very easy to get busy and just forget altogether. And then you're laying there in bed and you're like, oh, I did not read my Bible. Well, I'll have to read double tomorrow. And again, what did God say about holding it for tomorrow? That, that's not the point. The point was you missed the nourishment today. All right, so um, before your day gets going, that's what I'd say. Whatever time that is, if you got to get up a little earlier to do that, do that but before the sun melts it. 
Psalm 23 gives us the same illustration on Wednesday nights. If you're here, you may remember that the, um, the shepherd always wanted his flock out in the morning because as they ate the grass, they're dew on the grass. And they were nourished. They, a, a shepherd that has his flocks out in the early morning eating dew-laden grass many times doesn't even have to lead those sheep to water later that day because they get all they need right there in the morning right off the grass. And so it's another principle as, as if, you know, the, the shepherd brings the, the flock out there at 1 p.m., there's no dew on the grass. And so before the sun melts it. So this habit is it's important. Um, all the habits we'll talk about are important, but I'm telling you, nothing will change your life like this habit. Nothing will affect your Christian growth and walk with God like the habit of reading your Bible. And we need to get to a point where if we miss our Bible reading, we notice it. And we go, man, I, I, you know, I miss that thing that I always do. It ought to be a regular part of our day. In the Peanuts comic strip, you ever read that? They don't really do comic strips anymore. I guess they do somewhere, wherever you can buy a newspaper. But in the Peanuts comic strip, Sally was struggling with her memory verse for Sunday school. She was absorbed in her thoughts, trying to figure out. And then she remembered, maybe it was from the book of reevaluation. I think she meant Revelation. She never did find that memory verse. But perhaps we need to read the book of reevaluation. If our schedules do not allow us time in God's word. Listen, if you say, I just don't have time to read my Bible, you got to adjust your schedule. I, I read a quote by, I can't remember who it was. I should look it up so I can give them credit for it. But uh, some pastor somewhere, and he said, for those that say, I don't have time to read my Bible, I don't have time to pray. He said, I, I don't have time not to. Because he just knew the change that it makes in the day and the change that it makes in his life. So gather it daily, gather as much as you need, gather it before the sun melts it. And if you don't have this habit as a part of your daily life, do what? It, rearrange your schedule to get it in there. All right, we'll stop there. And uh, then tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, next Sunday, uh, we'll go over our second habit, which is prayer. Lord, we are uh, thankful for your word. Uh, we pray that you would help us, uh, help us to be convicted when we miss our Bible reading time. Help us to understand the point of it all, Lord, to get that spiritual nourishment that we need each day. Uh, help us, Lord, to be faithful to your word, and, um, to develop this habit in our life. And it will take some work. It'll take some moving schedules around. It'll take some discipline and some consistency to do so. But help us to get this into our life as a, as a regular part of our day. And uh, Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in our lives. We pray that in, in the end it would help us to grow be better servants for you. Lord, we pray you'd bless the service that, that follows this one and, and just be with us all day. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.